Hey, uh, welcome, welcome everyone. At this time, I would like to call to order the joint hearing of the House Congressional and Legislative Reapportionment Committee and the Senate Reapportionment and Redistricting Committee. This is our second virtual hearing and we have done things a little bit differently this time than we did the first. We, we learned, we're learning. We have included everyone on the sign up list who signed up to speak at this hearing. So we are going to go through each one of these people in the order in which they signed up. And we will call your name and ask you to unmute your mic at that time. Um, is, I guess we don't have any, yeah, okay. Um, this is our time to hear from you all, the members of the public. Um, in addition to um, some written testimony that we're also receiving on our websites. We have at this current time, 33 people signed up to speak. So we are going to allow each speaker three minutes. Um, and then we will do a last call if we have some time at the end of our uh, scheduled speakers. We have one more in-person committee meeting coming up. This will be the hearing that we had to reschedule in Augusta. It is now scheduled for August the 30th. We are, as I mentioned, collecting written comments. So if you would like to submit any testimony or uh, just your thoughts on the redistricting process, then we invite you to do so by clicking on the portal link on the House and Senate websites. You can find the link there uh, on our landing page at www.house.ga.gov and senate.ga.gov. Um, with that, I think I will turn this over to Senator Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Rich. Um, so uh, we are, as we did, as our beginning town hall meeting, uh, this virtual town hall, and we look forward to receiving the information from everyone. And of course, one of the things that we get asked a lot and what everyone wonders is, when will the special session be? And as we have reported at all of the town hall meetings, uh, we don't know that yet. The Census Bureau is still receiving or trying to get to us the partial data, which is supposed to be due in mid to late August, uh, that we could use to draw the maps with the full data coming in from the Census Bureau at the end of September. Uh, there's still some lawsuits involving the data. And so um, exact, the exact date of when we'll have that in a consumable or definite format remains to be seen. But nonetheless, we're committed to moving forward uh, as soon as we do have uh, data that, that is something we can work with. Uh, we're also going to be collecting, uh, in addition to comments from folks that have spoken at the previous meetings, also comments tonight, uh, but also other areas, other information from folks that want to talk to us or communicate with us, but don't want to do so either at the town hall meeting or at either of these virtual meetings. Uh, so we invite folks to submit information and data or any comments that they want to make uh, to our committee or our joint committees. Some point after the hearings, we're going to adopt redistricting guidelines and principles and we'll move forward uh, with those at some point in the future. So uh, for tonight, um, we uh, are gathering. And so how we're gonna approach things is similar to the way we've done all the other meetings, which is we're gonna watch a short video that has been produced by our media services folks to educate everybody on the basics of redistricting. And again, I wanna thank the media service folks for doing that. Um, then we're going to open it up to the individuals who will be uh, in, the, in the Zoom room, if you will, and we'll be calling on those in the order that have signed up. Um, as we've said before, and uh, we say it again because uh, it, we try to put emphasis on this, lots of times when politicians hold hearings and talk, it's really because they want to hear themselves talk, but that is not the purpose of tonight. It's not been the purpose of the previous hearings either. Uh, our purpose is to hear from you, the folks around Georgia, just as we did in 20, 10 years ago in 2011, and also 20 years ago to, in 2001 in a similar fashion. We're not here to ask you questions. We're not here to answer questions. We're here just to listen to whatever it is you want to convey to us. Um, 
in order to respect everyone's time, we're gonna have uh, a clock on the three minute cycle and ask everyone to please be respectful of that. That's just to make sure that the other folks that are in the waiting room and they're waiting to speak to us can adequately get their time in as well and in the, in the, uh, in the sequence that would be fair. Um, again, you can submit if you want to say, for those that speak, if there's something you want to submit to us for consideration that's in addition to the comments you've made, we would welcome those as well. Um, all of the hearings are being recorded, and so we'll have the benefit of those going forward. I want to thank the members of the committee, many of whom are uh, linked up with us tonight and this afternoon, and we'll be listening to everyone's comments. We also have a few folks in the room with us as well. Before we go to the video, Madam Chair, I think there's one thing maybe I neglected, and that is we usually open with prayer. And if so, maybe I'll say a, a brief prayer to get us going. If you would bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the great state of Georgia in which we have to live and the great people that live here. Thank you for all the benefits. We keep those in mind that are less fortunate. Please bless us to make well-reasoned decisions as we go forward in this and every endeavor that you have honored us to allow us to do for the people of Georgia. And bless us to all stay close in the days ahead. In Christ's name, amen. I think we'll cue the video now. Every 10 years following the decennial census, the process of redistricting begins all over our country. Let's take a look at what that redistricting is and what else we need to know before we begin this process in the state of Georgia. My name is Gina Wright, and I'm the executive director of the Office of Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment. We are a nonpartisan joint office of the Georgia General Assembly, and we serve both the House and the Senate. What is redistricting? As the population in our state grows, the number of people in each district must be adjusted so that the population in each district is as close to equal as practicable. This is done by redistricting or modifying the boundary lines of the districts. In Georgia, our new 2020 census resident population total is 10,711,908 people. Because of this population increase, each of our 14 congressional districts will need to adjust to have 765,136 people in them. At the state level, our legislative branch of government has 56 state senators and 180 representatives in the state house elected by districts. State Senate districts will be redrawn to now include around 191,284 people. State House districts will also need to increase in population size to around 59,511 people. In the Georgia General Assembly, there is a standing committee on redistricting in both the House and the Senate. Each committee has a chairman. Hi, I'm Bonnie Rich. I'm chairman of the Legislative and Congressional Reapportionment Committee in the State House. I've served in that capacity since 2019. Since 2018, I have represented District 97, which includes parts of Duluth, Swanee, and Sugar Hill in Gwinnett County. Hello, I'm State Senator John F. Kennedy, and I represent the 18th District in the State Senate, which includes all of Monroe, Peach, Crawford, and Upson Counties, and part of Bibb County and Houston County. I also am Chairman of the Senate Redistricting and Reapportionment Committee. What is reapportionment, and how is it different from redistricting? The term apportionment is the act of dividing and allocating representation proportionally. The United States Constitution requires that all 435 House districts shall be apportioned among the 50 states based on population from each decennial census. There is a guarantee of at least one seat per state in the United States House, and a method of equal proportions determines how the other 385 are distributed. Every 10 years, states may gain or lose congressional districts based on how they gained or lost population in comparison to other states based on data from the decennial census. The state of Georgia presently has 14 seats in the U.S. House, and the 2010 census resulted in a gain of one new seat for the state following an increase of two new districts in 2000. It's common to interchange the term reapportionment with the term redistricting, but the two terms really don't mean the same thing. 
Reapportionment only occurs at the federal level when U.S. House districts are distributed amongst the states. Even with a gain of over a million people in Georgia over the past decade, Georgia will continue to have 14 congressional districts. When does redistricting take place? Traditionally, the governor of Georgia issues a call for a special legislative session in late summer or early fall following the arrival of the new census data. The sole purpose of this session is to adopt newly redrawn maps for all statewide district plans and may also include new maps for local county commission or school board districts. The session occurs so that all county election officials have sufficient time to update voter district assignments once the process is complete prior to elections the next year. After the Georgia General Assembly adopts new maps and the governor signs the bills into law, they become the new election districts for use in the next election cycle or on the date specified in the legislation. This year, with COVID-related delays in the census, the special session will likely take place later in the year because we will not receive full census data until late August or September. What other factors do we have to consider besides equal population? The first mission of redistricting is to ensure that districts are roughly equal to each other. Equalizing population ensures that each individual's vote counts the same toward their representatives. But equal population is only one part of the puzzle. Maps must also comply with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and traditional principles of redistricting, like ensuring communities of interest are represented, avoiding major changes to existing representation in the legislature, and keeping local government jurisdictions whole. Those legal criteria are what often keeps maps from being drawn as perfect squares across our state. Why do we have public hearings? The redistricting process begins with hearing from the public. The General Assembly is ready to hear from you about the uniqueness of your part of the state, what communities of interest are here, and what important factors it should consider as we all prepare to redraw the districts later this year. All right, so now we will move to the portion of the hearing where we hear testimony from the individuals who have signed up. We are going to first hear from State House Representative Sheila Jones. Representative Jones, if you will unmute yourself, you can begin your testimony. After Representative Jones, we are going to hear from Mark Davis. Okay, all right. We are not hearing from Representative Jones, so we are going to move on to Mark Davis. We will come back to Representative Jones at the end. Uh, after Mark Davis, we will hear from Ken Lawler. Mr. Mark Davis, if you will unmute yourself, you can proceed. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Davis, and I've been working with voter data for about 35 years. I've been an advocate for election integrity for about 20 years, and I've, I've served as an expert witness in five disputed elections um, involving residency, redistricting, and um, vote fraud issues. And I have a real simple request for you, and I... Uh, I had a longer presentation prepared with, with evidence from two of the court cases I testified in that I won't have time to present here today, but I'm gonna boil down my concern to one simple thing, okay? As you know, we currently have about 300,000 or so census blocks in Georgia. And the goal of the um, reapportionment bill is to identify which of those blocks go with which district. And rather than list all 300,000 and something blocks in the bill, which would make it miles long, for brevity, when you're talking about a whole county, you just say all of Banks County or all of Stevens County or whatever the case may be, okay? I would urge you to please consider not defining a county that way because there are games being played with county boundaries. 
under Georgia law, it's the legislature who sets those boundaries by meets and bounds. But in court cases, as a practical matter, when I've testified in them, sometimes counties will come in and say they have a new survey that redefines their county boundaries. Now, every year the Census Bureau gives them an opportunity, counties and municipalities, to redefine the boundaries of, of their county or municipality. Without doing that and without going through the legislature, sometimes they'll walk into a courtroom and say, well, we have a brand new survey that shows our boundaries as this. And then the judge says, well, well, who says when the, when the reapportionment bill says all of Banks County, who, who, who defines what Banks County is? And when the county walks in with a new survey, um, judges will find that compelling. So I urge you to do one simple step when you write this bill, properly define the county. Because my understanding of the purpose of the bill is so that you can define these districts by census block. And when you refer to an entire county, you're doing that just for simplification purposes. But nowhere in the bill, the last one anyway, does it say all census blocks in X county. And if you do that one simple step, it will prevent counties from playing games with the boundaries. Um, a recent very infamous example of this happened up in Banks County. Um, it involved the sheriff of Banks County. He lives in a census block that is contained in neighboring Franklin County. Um, he doesn't actually live in Banks County, but he's walked into courtroom with a survey that shows he did and the judge found it compelling and nothing can be done. Uh, essentially, Banks County got to define its own borders. I saw the same thing recently in a case I testified in down in Long County. They walked in with a survey and showed a bunch of, a bunch of voters who actually live in neighboring Liberty County um, they claim our voters in Long County. You guys can stop that nonsense by simply defining a county as all census blocks as defined by the US Census Bureau instead of just saying all of blank county. That one simple distinction, you can cut out that nonsense. And that's the Thank gist you. of my presentation, but I would, I would welcome the opportunity to appear before you and show you evidence of, of this as it happened in some of these cases and, and get into the issue deeper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Your time has expired, but if you need to conclude, you can wrap it up. Um, I've, got, I've got some maps to show you. I can share screens, but I don't want to go over the time. Okay. I know a lot of people want to talk, right. but okay. if, if I can come down and bring this down and, and show you guys evidence where this has actually happened in disputed elections cases, it's caused havoc. And okay. you guys can easily put a stop to it in your definitions of, of the way you def define counties. You know, normally the way a bill is crafted, you'll have a definition section. And if you just include, if you just make it clear that when you're talking about a whole county, you're referring to all the census blocks in that county. If you just do that, it's over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Okay, um, we will now move on to Ken Lawler, who will be followed by Mira Seidau. Mr. Lawler, if you will unmute yourself. Can you hear me all right? Good? Okay. Uh, yes, we see. Kennedy Rich and members of the committee, I'm Ken Lawler, Chair of Fair Districts Georgia, and I am pleased to have another opportunity to address the committees. As you know, we are a nonpartisan organization advocating for fair maps. I thought as these hearings draw to a close, it would be helpful to take a brief look at what we've all heard and then talk about the way forward. My perspective is that we've heard lots of input along three major themes. Number one, keep my community together. Number two, maps should be fair and nonpartisan. And number three, protect communities of color and diverse ethnicity. Sounds simple to take all that into account, but it isn't. You have a very challenging job ahead to draw maps based on this wealth of input that you have received. I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about where do we go from here. And one of the other major themes that we've all heard in these hearings is about transparency, making the process transparent and open to the public. I'd like to challenge you a little bit on the timeline. I believe that in fact, we know enough to, to lay out a timeline now for the work remaining. And I'd like to challenge the committee to go ahead and provide a timeline to the public based on your best estimate of the work. 
Our data experts tell us that this August 16th census data are complete and good enough to begin drawing maps. We don't have to wait for September 30th. Based on that, I believe we can lay out, you could lay out a timeline that shows the map drawing work, and then you could then plot in a second series of meetings around the state to discuss draft maps. This is the single biggest outstanding request we've heard is that the public wants to comment on the draft maps. I believe you could also publish estimated special session dates now, even if they have to change. We understand there may be complications, the work may run into some challenges, but I think it would be helpful to publish the estimated special session dates now. Speaking as a member of the public, I think we can understand that some dates might have to change. We could trade some uncertainty for visibility into the timeline and what's going on. I also believe that we need to hold hearings on the guidelines now. I should say you need to hold hearing on the guidelines now. Guidelines govern the mapping work, which starts on August 16th. Our organization, as well as others, have submitted written testimony about, guide, about input to those guidelines. Another thing we need to offer is allow submission of maps by citizens. The current written testimony input on the website is text only. This is an easy one. Have your folks change the Google form on the website to allow the attachment of a document with maps and graphics. Now, in addition to maps, we would ask in the theme of transparency for you to release not only the maps, but your analysis of the proposed maps. Explain all the factors that you used in map preparation. Show how they comply with the Voting Rights Act and commit to meeting independent nonpartisan benchmarks for maps as we have discussed. Prepared to Six Georgia, our partners at the Princeton Gerrymandering Project and other organizations across the state stand willing to be partners in this process and help. We are offering our assistance and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawler. We now will move on to Mira Seidau, followed by Paul McCrary. Mira Seidau, if you will unmute yourself. Um, hello. So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Mira Sido. I'm 19 years old and I have lived in Georgia nearly my entire life. Um, I am mixed race and I grew up with kind of one foot in each world at the intersection of the Hispanic community in Gwinnett and the Asian American community in Fulton as well as Gwinnett. Uh, despite being surrounded by people who looked like me and who could celebrate both of my cultures, I never saw myself even remotely reflected in my state representation until about two years ago with Senator Michelle Aw. And this, this is just not enough. So according to the US Census Bureau, about half of Georgians are non-Hispanic white and about a third are black and around 10% are Hispanic or Latino. But this is not reflected yet in the Georgia state legislature, which is about 70% non-Hispanic white, 27% black and only about 1% Hispanic or Latino. Uh, white communities are vastly overrepresented, which puts minority communities like the ones I'm a part of at a disadvantage. And because of this, we struggle to pass health care reform, expanded voting rights, and diverse education policies that are so necessary for our communities to thrive. And this all leads back to redistricting. When communities are not represented in the state House and Senate, they are not represented on the redistricting joint committee, and they cannot advocate for their unique interests behind the, behind the closed doors of the map drawing process. This joint committee before me is overwhelmingly white, and there are no Asian or brown Hispanic representation on the committee. There was no clear effort made to ensure that the redistricting committee was composed of a diverse slate of senators and representatives who accurately reflect the perspectives and experiences of all Georgians. While I am grateful for the opportunity to speak at all, these hearings can't help but feel like some kind of consolation prize for not putting in the effort to have a truly representative joint committee. In this sense, we've already failed to create fair districts. Moving forward, we need to pay special attention to ensuring that perspectives not represented on this committee are part of the process. And that means more than just hearings. We need non-governmental committees that represent Georgia's diversity and culture and thought. We need full transparency in the redistricting process. We need more hearings after we, after we can look at the full census data. We need multilingual resources to publicize redistricting committee hearings and information about the redistricting process. And we need all voices to be heard. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Seidel. Next, we have Paul McCrary, followed by Varun Vishwanath. Mr. McCrary. Hello. You can unmute and yourself and you proceed. Committee for giving me a chance to address you all today to talk about my community of Columbia County, which is located in East Georgia. Before I get started, my name is Paul McCrary. I grew up in Grovetown for the past 16 years. 
I like to say that my generation of Grovetown residents grew up with the city just because of how fast the city has grown. Sadly, over the past decade, Grovetown residents, like residents of every single municipality in Columbia County, are split up in legislative maps. I am here to stress the importance of following city boundaries throughout the state and especially in areas like Columbia County, which experienced a growth rate of over 26% in the past decade, according to the census estimates of 2019. Over the past couple years, multiple local issues concerning communities in my county were brought before you to the state legislator. Harlem's attempt to expand their city boundaries and the separation of Columbia County from the Augusta Judicial Court are just two examples of local issues that have taken place since 2019, where the people impacted were needlessly represented by different legislators. This risks residents being placed in a district where they have a legislator who do not care about local issues since it does not impact the majority of their constituents. Given that Columbia County could play a dominant role in a state Senate district, we should all be kept together in one state Senate district. This keeps our communities together and helps us advocate for local issues that are brought up to the state legislator, especially at a time when our community is experiencing rapid growth. We attend the same schools, the same places of worship, we shop at the same places, we all have similar backgrounds. There is absolutely no reason we are not represented by the same state senator and federal congressman. I hope that you will consider my plea to place my community in one district so that we can advocate for issues that would impact us on a local issue that are still decided by the state legislator. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. McCrary. Next, we have Varun Bishwanath, followed by Alex Ames. Varun Bish Thank you. Bishwanath. Uh, yeah, thank you to all the members of the committee for holding this hearing today. Uh, I just wanted to speak on a few main issues. Uh, firstly, on federal voting laws. Um, I hope that the commission uh, takes into account very carefully the requirements of federal uh, voting laws, particularly the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, this is the first time that Georgia as a whole will not have to submit um, its legislative maps for a preclearance to the US Department of Justice. So I just wanna make sure that the commission still keeps in mind that there are um, requirements under section two and un under other sections that need to be considered during redistricting uh, to avoid very costly and drawn out federal lawsuits um, as have taken place over the past decade in North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, and also just in, in drawing particularly legislative, uh, state legislative district maps, I hope the commission will try to keep um, municipalities together We'll try to keep um, communities of interest, people with like-minded interests together as much as possible, uh, because uh, especially at the, at the very local level, it's important that communities can, speak, can be able to speak as a whole and have their interests heard um, appropriately in the, uh, in the General Assembly. And that's very difficult to happen when, uh, when those communities are divided, when they're split. Um, and then just as an ad administrative issue, um, I hope the, um, the commission will also uh, be able to minimize the number of precinct splits. Uh, this is another election administration issue that when we have excessive um, precinct splits, it can make parsing election data uh, very difficult. So I hope the um, commission will consider that as they move forward. And, um, and last thing is I, I want to just remind the committee that it would be ideal if they could hold more hearings after preliminary maps are, are, are drawn and are um, released uh, to allow input from communities across the state on, um, on the proposals and that would create better maps overall for all Georgians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vishwanath. Next we have Alex Ames followed by Ochiba Atta. Alex Ames does not appear to be in the waiting room. We'll come back to him at the end. Next, we have Ochiba Atta, followed by Mason Cochran. Ochiba Atta? Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay. Hello, committee members, and thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, again, my name is Ochiba Atta, and I'm a lifelong resident of Marietta, which is in Cobb County. And I'm also currently a member of a transit and community advocacy group for Cobb County government. And the reason why I joined this advocacy group is because I believe, as I hope 
sorry about that. I believe as you guys hope, I believe as I hope you guys do too, that the best people to advocate for issues affecting certain communities are those from said communities. But unfortunately, I do not believe that is the case for Marietta. My entire life, I only had wealthy and white representatives. And so I always assumed that Marietta was largely a white and wealthy city. And uh, my family and the black community, they, sorry, and the black community that we were in was an outlier. But then I learned that that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Marietta has been a majority minority city for some time. Over 30% of our residents are black and we are also one of Cobb's poorest cities. Yet Marietta is cracked among three districts, District 6, 33, and 37 on the Senate level, as well as Districts 34, 37, and 42 on the State House level. And this ensures that Marietta has only ever had one person of color represent any part of it. And that only occurred in 2015. And again, the best people to advocate for communities are those from it. And the dividing Marietta prevents that. And we can see this in Cobb Transit, which as someone who doesn't drive, I can tell you is fairly poor. And if Marietta wasn't divided and was able to elect working class and people of color as representatives, then those representatives would have been better able to advocate to allow counties to level a higher sales tax in House Bill 930, which passed in 2018, so that Cobb could have better and more properly fund its transit needs. So Marietta residents and Cobb residents can be connected to their jobs in Atlanta via that transit, which would have spurred economic growth and prosperity in our city and our county. And so I sincerely ask you to ensure that in this level, in this redistricting, that Marietta and communities like ours are not divided so our representatives can truly be people like us in our communities, share our stories and advocate for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ata. Next, we have Mason Cochran, followed by John Bronzy. It appears that Mason Cochran is not in the waiting room, so we will move on. John Bronzy will be next, followed by Maria Fernandez. John Hello. Um, can I can I share my screen? Yes, you're you're sharing. Are you Mr. Bronzy? Yes. But okay. I mean, is it okay? Because I yes. drew a mock-up of a uh, community interest I'd like to see. Could I share that here? Is that allowed? Can I do that? I don't know. Is that allowed to share the screen? No, I'm so sorry. I was I was uh, checking. Okay. The rules, um, That's fine. And it, not okay. Thank you for right. asking. All right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I looking at the current map for congressional districts. I've noticed there's only four districts where the majority is black voters. Proportionally, there should be five, and it seems like that's because they have far more black voters than they need in those districts to ensure a black congressman gets elected. And that doesn't seem fair to them. It sort of boils them down into the black districts, in my opinion. And that's not a very, it's sort of not fair to them. I don't know. Um, I know I live in Atlanta proper and it is a majority black community but it's split up so that the wide parts, which are um, elect, which would be able to elect black voters candidate of choice into their own thing, into their own district. And 
I would suggest not doing that and to keep Atlanta in one congressional district and maybe even put Sandy Springs or something. And that would still be a majority black district. I imagine it would still easily be able to elect a black congressman. And it would also not pack black voters into this one district without giving them the say in others. I don't claim to speak only for them, but that just seems like a common sense thing to do for me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Bronzy. Next, we have Maria Fernandez, followed by Andrea Young. Maria Fernandez? Okay, I'm told that Maria Fernandez is not in the waiting room. So we will move on to Andrea Young, followed by Christopher Bruce. Andrea Young, you may proceed. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Thank you so much, Chairs Kennedy and Rich. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Andrea Young, Executive Director of the ACLU of Georgia. Uh, I and members of the ACLU team have joined you for each of these hearings across the state. Uh, the ACLU has members and supporters white, black, Asian, Hispanic in every Georgia County who care deeply about our democracy and the right to vote for every Georgia citizen. With only one exception, every ACLU staff person who spoke with you was, was born and are raised from childhood in this state. In, diver in Georgia, diversity is our strength. And as we watch the Olympic games with our families, we remember when the world came to Georgia for the Centennial Olympic games in 1996, and loved our great state. So today, more than 45% of voting age Georgians identify as Black, Hispanic, or Asian Americans. Diversity has increased from the coast to the mountains. For example, in the last decade, the Hispanic voting age population has grown by more than 20% in Greater Dalton and Greater Columbus. The Asian American voting age population grew by 27% in Greater Macon and 74% in Greater Brunswick. The Black population is increased by 24% in Metro Atlanta and 103% in Greater Cumming. So we urge you during this process to be transparent uh, and to provide opportunity for meaningful citizen input, uh, particularly after there are draft maps. We urge you to draw maps that ensure that in Georgia, Black Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans have the same opportunity to elect candidates of their choice as white Americans do. When you watch the Olympics, we look at the great diversity of our medal winners from the pool, the mat, the courts to the field and the track, Team USA looks like America and our elected representatives in Georgia should as well. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Young. Next, we have Christopher Bruce, followed by Christina Williams. Christopher Bruce, I'm told, is not in the waiting room, so we will move on. Christina Williams will be next, followed by Sharice Kim. Christina Hi, Williams? Can hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you now. Good evening, chairs and members of the Joint Committee on Redistricting. My name is Christina Williams, and I'm a student leader at the oldest HBCU in the Southern United States, Clark Atlanta University. I'm also an intern with the ACLU of Georgia and a college chapter leader with Ignite National, a nonpartisan organization that empowers young women to become the next generation of political leaders. The Atlanta University Center, which consists of Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse College and Spelman College is the oldest and largest contiguous consortium of African-American higher education institutions in the world. Established to educate newly freed African-Americans at the end of the Civil War, our shared history dates back to 1865 and is bolstered by a rich legacy of civil rights organizing. Our graduates include industry leaders in media, medicine, journalism, politics, and much more. We are unique in that although we are a consortium of several institutions, we all share the same buildings, classes, extracurricular events, 
and even the same plots of grass. Yet our political power as a community is fractured. Under the current maps, the AUC is contained within Congressional District 5 and Senate District 36, but is split between House Districts 56 and 57. Elected officials are at times quick to dismiss the concerns of young people and our being split by district lines has only exacerbated this problem. In the three years I've been a Clark Atlanta University student, I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen any of my elected officials make a genuine effort to listen and respond to student concerns, let alone visit any of our campuses. In 2016, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical University, the nation's largest HBCU, was also divided into split districts. After years of costly litigation, the maps were redrawn to place the university into just one district. And as a result, voter turnout and civic participation on campus increased substantially in 2020. Today, I asked this committee to view the Atlanta University Center as a community of interest and to draw us into the same congressional, state senate, and state house districts. I also asked this committee to commit to holding more public town halls once the full census data is released and the new maps are drawn and to hold at least one on a weekend so that they are more accessible to students. Young people are not apathetic. We are justifiably skeptical of a system that for too long has not responded to our realities. We are the future of Georgia, and we deserve fairness, equity, and transparency in this process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Sharice Kim. Sharice Kim? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you to the chairs and members of the House and Senate redistricting committees for the chance to speak in front of you today. My name is Sharice Kim. I am an intern at the ACLU of Georgia and a Georgia resident for the last 16 years of my life. I moved to the state at the age of three and have been fortunate enough to spend every bit of my childhood in Alpharetta and the North Fulton area. I now attend college out of state in Maryland and look forward to every single time I get to return to my family, friends, and the state that I've called home for the better part of my entire life. Now, throughout this time, I have witnessed the state undergo drastic changes, including becoming far more diverse than it was when I was in the third grade, the last time a census was conducted. I and others like me have not been blind to the immense change in not only our immediate areas, but in those of our friends and peers across the entire state, in the communities of people we've been fortunate enough to serve, and in the various diaspora communities that we belong to. We have not, however, seen these changes reflected in how we are represented. And today I'm here to ask for demands that I'm sure you're all familiar with, fair redistricting maps and a fair redistricting process. This consists of providing more opportunities for public hearings and town halls so that the voice of every Georgian can be heard. It means drawing maps fairly and accurately to reflect the ever-increasing diversity of our state, transparently sharing the criteria which are used to draw the maps, and allotting time for the public to give feedback about whether they accurately reflect their communities. And very importantly, it means committing to meeting independent, nonpartisan benchmarks. Georgians deserve your commitment to these standards of transparency and fairness for the sake of not only your current voters, but for the next tw 10, 20, 30 years of future voters for whom your decisions on this matter are absolutely crucial. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next we have Sine Parani. Miss, okay, Miss Parani is not in the room, not in the Zoom room. We'll go next to uh, Alexandria Patterson. Sandria Patterson. Hello. Uh -oh. I think we're okay. hearing you. Can now. you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Great. Great. Um, okay. Good evening, fellow Georgians. My name is Alexandria Dominique Prince, and I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia and Emory University School of Nursing. I'm a proud healthcare worker and nurse practitioner, and I'm a born and raised resident of Georgia. As was my father, John Paul Prince, and my mother, Joyce Ann Former Prince. My paternal grandparents and my maternal grandparents were all native Georgians, as well as their parents, my great grandparents. I say all this to say that I am as Georgia as Georgia can get. 
Although my ancestors were denied their rights to education, marriage, voting, and basic civil liberties and rights, they passed the hope of the American dream down from generation to generation to me. I was raised to believe that I am not greater than, never less than, but equal to anyone else. I did not really know what it meant to be disenfranchised or not have equal rights growing up in Southwest Atlanta, Georgia. As a child, my friendships included all races and religions. We only knew that we were good people and fair to each other. Our dreams are the same as all other Americans. Have a safe home and community, good education, and be able to aspire to the American dream. If I ask any other race of people what their dreams were for their family and friends, if I close my eyes, I could not tell if that answer came from an African American, Asian American, European American, Latin American, Jewish American, Middle Eastern American, or Native American, Democrat or Republican. Every race has sewn into the Georgia fabric, and it has been passed on to us to see our ancestors' dreams being true. Equality for all. This can be done through a fair and representative redistricting process. Gerrymandering, as you know, is when the politicians manipulate voting district boundaries to favor one party over another. So what happens when one party controls the House, the State House, the State Senate, and the Governor's Mansion? Although this seems ideal today, what happens when you swing the pendulum too far? And what seems fair and in your interest at first is now suppressive to your own beliefs tomorrow. The act of gerrymandering is so egregious that in 1963, in Gray v. Sanders, the court first articulated the principle of one person, one vote, and striking down Georgia's county-based system for counting votes in Democratic primary elections for the office of U.S. Senator. Through its diverse, rich history and economic leadership, so it so goes Georgia, so goes the New South. Like my ancestors, we are the gatekeepers for this next generation. Change is coming, equality is coming. We must work together to represent the diverse history of Georgia and its evolving future so that it includes every Georgian's American dream. In fact, when looking at the percentages, Georgia has the third highest percentage of African-Americans in the United States. Georgia has also had the second highest growth in Asians during the period between 2000 and 2010. During this time period, the population of Asians almost doubled, and recent estimates show that 4% of the total population identifies as Asian. The number of Hispanics in the state, particularly Puerto Ricans, has increased in recent years, and Hispanic, Caribbean, Sub-Saharan, African, and Asians have settled in Georgia, particularly in the metro Atlanta area. My hope is that the commission takes into consideration the changing demographics and fairly represent all Georgians. Our history and our future is more than slavery, segregation, and suppression of individual rights. Our history and our future are based on the hopes and dreams of our ancestors. So who are we? We are Georgians. We are the New South. We are the American dream. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Uh, next, Theron Johnson, please. Uh, good evening, committee members. My name is Theron Johnson. I'm the Georgia State Director for All Online. Uh, the goal is fair maps, and fair maps can only be achieved through a transparent and inclusive redistricting process. As it stands, the current format of public hearings has significantly restricted the ability of many Georgians to have their voices heard. The majority of Georgians reside in the metro Atlanta area, counties that have seen the highest levels of growth. Despite this, opportunities for official public engagement have been lacking. There have been no sessions in Cobb, DeKalb, or Gwinnett counties, and only one hearing in Atlanta. Hearings have been all but inaccessible to Georgians who lack private transportation and to non-native English speakers due to a lack of translation services. Given that census data won't be released until mid-August, uh, there are no specific proposals for the public to respond to during these hearings. And there have been, there's been no information provided to the public regarding the opportunities for public input once proposed maps have been drafted. It is extremely problematic that during this week's hearing in Columbus, uh, Chairwoman Rich stated that she does not think that it would be possible to hold a second hearing tour, including the Metro Atlanta area after census data is made available. There must be hearings held after final census data is received to ensure a fair and transparent process where we, the public, have a voice and we will not accept anything less. Beyond that, there's uncertainty about how the public input will be formally recognized or considered by the committees at all. If the committees fail to take the public's input on proposed maps into account or simply deny the public opportunity to provide feedback at all, 
we could wind up with maps that effectively disenfranchise large swaths of voters in the state. So in closing, uh, I leave with these recommendations. Members of the redistricting committees must read the public testimony into the record and consider it when drawing proposed maps. When census data is released and maps are proposed, the committee sh should provide opportunities for public comment on those maps and ensure accessibility by public transportation and through language translation services. In closing, uh, democracy is at its best when its processes and systems are fair, transparent, equitable, and accessible. And we should accept nothing less from our redistricting process. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Campbell. Good evening, honorable chairs and members of the reapportionment committee. Thank you for your service. My name is Lisa Campbell and I've lived the majority of my 53 years as a resident of Georgia, a Georgia homeowner, business owner, employer, taxpayer, an active voting citizen interested in ensuring a fair and equitable redistricting process. I wanna share a much loved quote that my father often extends, one that was spoken by a favorite community leader when inviting folks to do the right thing, to join in. He invited all those who can, who will, and who want to. Today, I ask the same of you committee members, can you, will you, and do you want to ensure our redistricting process is equitable and transparent? In my home of Cobb County, according to a recent report by NPR, voter registration has increased more than a third since 2012. In that time, the number of non-white voters has increased by nearly 82% while the number of white registered voters increased only 24%. And according to census data during the same time period, Georgia's population grew by almost 10%. The number of black people living in Georgia increased by 15%. The population of Asian American and Pacific Islanders increased by 40%. And the population of Hispanic and Latinx increased by 22%. So while Georgia and Cobb County have expanded in diversity and are estimated to be only 52% white and more than 51% female, the Georgia reapportionment committees are dominated still by white men, 70% male, 70% white. My question is, do the people who draw the lines reflect our state's diversity? Can you, will you, do you want the committee to mirror the population of our state? I request expanding and or replacing committee membership with a more diverse panel that accurately reflects our state's expanded constituency. Secondly, I have a question about our commitment to transparency. It has been reported by NPR that committee chairs have been holding closed door meetings with lawmakers, and we can all witness this with an online link to sign up. But openly sharing the fact that you will be having closed door private meetings is not what most of us would consider to be a transparent practice. Why not open the doors and share the names of the participants and disclose the notes for public review? I also request that when the open committees meet, the sessions not be held at the same time. I request that you protect citizens' ability to attend all meetings in person and virtually, and that you publish the process with all public comments so that they can be reviewed, categorized, and applied to redistricting. And most importantly, that you allow ample time for constituents to share feedback on the proposed maps. My third question is around communication. Why aren't we using more channels to share information about redistricting with all Georgians? Collectively, we have the infrastructure to share statewide information with all residents. You can do it, but will you? But can you, will you, and do you want to? Ensure the people's voices are heard and ensure that our diversity that is increasing in our state will result in equitable voting districts in Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Amaya Agnahatari. Oh, all right. Um, not in the Zoom room, I'm told. So. Next, uh, Shaza Anjum. Shaza Anjum. Thank you for the opportunity, representatives. My name is Shaza Enjim. I'm 19 years old. I'm a college student and a community organizer living in Midtown Atlanta. 
I currently work three jobs and I've taken time out of my schedule to prepare this testimony and be here to present it. In these last nine hearings, we've seen a lot of brave young people step up to speak to their experiences. We've heard specific requests for representation that reflects community interests. We've heard cries for fair and contiguous mapping for college campuses, historically marginalized areas, communities of color and working class people. Ultimately, we are all here today because we are asking to be seen, to be heard. Not being heard, it is a particular kind of pain. It is a pain marked by frustration, apathy, and disillusionment. Young people know this pain all too well. With the rapidly changing climate, displacement and class struggle, health crises, and mass extinction events, sometimes our lives just feel like an unremitting state of emergency that is never meaningfully addressed. We are constantly forced to contend with conditions that we did not create or consent to. And with unfairly drawn lines, our ability to meaningfully advocate for a better world is stifled. We are told that young people are meant to be the future, people empowered to lead, people who have the ability to usher in a new era of betterment, but we cannot do it in these voiceless conditions. Representatives of the reapportionment committee do not let these hearings be in vain. Do not let them serve as some performative gesture, but as a genuine means of betterment. For almost 20 hours now, we have spoken. The words have left our mouths and now we implore you to hear them and act. We implore you to take on the urgent responsibility of not letting our voices go unheard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have Chief Marion McCormick. Chief Marion McCormick. Okay, I'm told Chief Marion McCormick, McCormick is not in the Zoom room. Next will be Kayla Kane. Kayla Kane, please. Hi, dear. Hello. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? We can. You have the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dear Chair Rich, Chair Kennedy, and community members, my name is Kayla Kane, and I'm a data and research analyst at the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to upholding the fundamental right of all citizens to vote and to ensuring that their vote is not diluted by unfair, unlawful redistricting plans. I am currently living in Decatur, Georgia, and have lived in Georgia for the majority of my life. Throughout these summer town halls, the Joint Redistricting Committee has been aware of several concerns from the public and advocates, some of which include the following, making the town halls more accessible to all Georgians, including those with limited English proficiency, hearing impairments, wheelchairs, and compromised immunity. Two, answering questions. Three, releasing the committee guidelines as soon as possible. Our neighbors in Alabama have already released those guidelines. Number four, upgrading the current Google form for written comments to include attachments. Number five, promising to hold additional town halls after the full comprehensive census data has been released. Providing transparency, including releasing all proposed redistricting plans to the public for comment before they are adopted. And lastly, accompanying data relied upon in the committee's decision, releasing all of those data. Thus far, the Joint Redistricting Committee has decided to take no action on any concerns. For such an important process that will impact all 10.7 million people living in Georgia for potentially the next decade, we are disappointed in the inaction of this committee. We will continue to advocate for a fair redistricting process and a fair redistricting plans because the consequences of these redistricting plans will be and have historically been so enormous for all Georgians. Georgia has historically diluted the voting strength of people of color, denying them a fair opportunity to elect their candidate of choice. We employ you to break from the shameful history. Receiving meaningful community input from all Georgians is a critical first step in pushing Georgia forward. We hope that you seriously consider our suggestions and strive to produce a public input process and distressing maps that provide fair representation to all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ashrakat Hassan. Ashrakat Hassan, please. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashraqat Hassan. I'm a digital organizing intern at the Georgia Muslim Voter Project, also known as GMVP. GMVP is a nonpartisan organization that works to civically engage Muslim communities and the individuals that reside among them in an effort to increase voter registration, voter awareness, and their desire to actively participate in the democratic process. I think that in order to really understand the severity of the registration process, I wish to humanize my own community, the Clarkson community. I've been a resident of Clarkson, Georgia since I immigrated here in 2003. It's been deemed the Ellis Island of the South and um, it has so many diverse citizens that have brought their families, uh, cultivated homes, built and sustained businesses and lived their lives right here in Atlanta's backyard. I urge you all as a resident of Clarkson to keep our community together. Clarkson's diversity has brought over 800 worshipers to our local mosque, my mosque, Mazda Mu'minin. Clarkson now boasts more than 100 small businesses and restaurants that are owned by immigrants and their families. Clarkson's community has rallied together time and time again, from vaccine and school drives to election season to festivals. Clarkson is as tight knit as it gets. This is a small town that lives and breathes with meaning for so many. Our youth attend Indy Creek Elementary. We dine and shop in the small Somali businesses and restaurants of the Campus Plaza. We play at Millen Park. These places are the focal point of who we are as Clarkston residents. By breaking Clarkston up, we would be breaking our center, our home. The current political boundaries keep us together. And quite frankly, we like to keep them that way. Clarkston has created a safe haven for immigrants and non-English speakers. There are classes at our local community center that one can take to understand the basics of the English language. Volunteers dedicate their time to taking care of the children of these families as they acclimate themselves to Clarkston and all that it has to offer. Family businesses offer a sense of home away from home as they sell familiar foods and different goods. Despite its problems, this is home. 30% of the population is without health insurance. 30% of the people living within Clarkston live in poverty. Additionally, a majority of the Clarkston population is not voter eligible, yet there are plans within the local government to ensure all residents are eligible to do so. If Clarkston were to be divided after this process concludes, these plans, these issues, and my beloved community will get left behind. Redistricting isn't just some mundane political process. It has the potential to negatively redefine and reinvent communities like mine. I wanna know, Will you commit to upholding Clarkson's spirit or will you use your power to forever change my community? It's your call. Have a great evening. Thank you. Next will be Opal Baker. Opal Baker. Yes, good evening. One moment, please. Um, Good evening. Uh, my name is Opal Baker and I reside in East Point, Georgia. I'm a volunteer with uh, the Georgia Peanut Gallery and Fair Fight Action. There is no question that Georgia's population has swelled significantly over the past year. Uh, this is well documented in the Georgia Department of uh, Economic Development and uh, local and uh, national media. Um, your census uh, data that was released in April certainly bears, bears this out, uh, that Georgia's economic growth. Um, so as a 2020 census worker, uh, knocking on doors in my uh, neighborhood and the areas surrounding East Point in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, I literally came face to face with the extra long list of households provided by the census daily. As you already know, um, accounting, uh, according to the uh, US Census, our population in Georgia has grown by over 1.7 million people. That's a lot of new doors to knock, and it's a signal um, you know, that our future is bright in, in Georgia. Still, uh, my concern about past behaviors by our local governments spill into my concern for the future, um, the harm it, will, it, might, uh, it might bring, the potential harm. Uh, given the historical issues with gerrymandering and the jockeying for power in the Georgia legislature, not to mention the current climate of just hyper-partisan division, I am concerned about the impact your redistricting process will have on my community and communities like mine. It is clear that Republicans um, currently have the advantage in Georgia as both the state house and Senate are GOP controlled the passing of the signing into law of SB 202 
does very little to assuage my concerns about the uh, motivations of the leadership in our in our Georgia legislature, as uh, that law seriously in, infringes on my access to the ballot box. I have three major concerns that uh, about how your body will address redistricting um, the redistricting process. My first concern is about a potential the potential of or the lack. Um, the potential of the lack of bi bipartisanship. In the process of um, ramming S SB 202 through to law um, is an indication uh, of the mindset of the body that will be responsible for such an important and transformative task as redistricting. I am not hopeful um, about the outcome or that the outcome will reflect the needs of my community when uh, government leadership is not reflective of the people being served, we, the people, are the ones who will have the most, be most negatively impacted by your actions. It is imperative that your decision-making process includes an equitable number of non-GOP representatives whose voices will be heard throughout the redistricting process. Second, how will you guarantee that neighborhoods um, are not split up? What is your plan for ensuring community involvement while the lines are being drawn? Who has been um, invited to sit at the table to represent and describe our neighborhoods and our cities? Whose voices will you listen to when you are dividing up our state? It is imperative that the process of creating districts keep communities of like interests and needs together while ensuring that the historical practice of using cracking and packing tactics is abolished. Maps must be equitable and representative and communities must have a say in how their community lines are drawn to ensure that we have a fair chance of electing the candidates of our choice. Finally, it is my um, expectation that full transparency will be the order of the day during the redistricting process. Um, unlike the aggressive take, and surreptitious- you would, please take just a moment, take up 10 seconds or so and wrap up, please. Well, um, unlike the, the aggressive and surreptitious uh, to, uh, SB 202, this process must not happen behind closed doors. Since we all can cannot be in the room with you, the public deserves a, a review of this process through um, frequent updates and represent representation by the organizations that represent us. In this way, oversight is broad, uh, varied, and relevant. And since I'm out of time, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy Schmidt, please. Stacy Schmidt. Hello, all. Thank you for having us. I would like to start by thanking you for taking the time to be here today to engage in meaningful conversation with hopes that it will inspire transformative and long lasting change. My name is Dr. Stacy Schmidt. I'm a DeKalb County resident of more than 10 years and lived in Fulton County prior to that. I serve as a primary care physician and medical director of a large safety net primary care practice serving both of these counties in Georgia. Additionally, I serve on the board of a community-based center dedicated to improving the health of women with emphasis on women of color who have experienced health disparities both prior to and as a result of this pandemic. I'm a proud woman, of, a proud mom of two vibrant kids and the wife of a hardworking intensive care physician who has seen firsthand the disparities COVID has brought to our communities. Finally, I serve as a co-leader for my daughter's Girl Scout troop and my son's Cub Scout troop. I continue to be re-energized by the creativity and energy of our youth and what they bring to solving problems in their communities. My children have uh, planted and donated tomatoes and cucumbers to a local community garden serving Maynard Jackson High School and surrounding communities, and are currently thinking about pet adoption through a doggy wash being held in Northeast Georgia. I speak from the shared experience of serving these varied and vibrant communities, which bring together young and old, male and female, black and white, as well as the unemployed and the professional. I consider it a deep honor to speak on the shared experiences of these communities within our state, 
who deserve to have their collective voices and input heard as it relates to redistricting and community resource distribution. The first step towards real change for redistricting is transparency and inclusivity. It is key. As a doctor, I know firsthand that health begins where we work, live, and play. That means that health begins in our communities. And believe it or not, it doesn't start as a young adult, not even an adolescent, nor does it start at birth. Health starts in the womb. Data has shown that pregnant women exposed to chronic stress in their communities, stress that is related to under-resourced schools, poor access to healthcare, lack of job opportunities, lack of adequate transportation, and food insecurity have worse maternal and infant health outcomes. These poor outcomes affect the long-term health of their children, manifesting as chronic disease such as high blood pressure, mental health issues, obesity, and diabetes late into adulthood. All of these aforementioned issues can be addressed, but it first starts with drawing fair districts and maps. If we are to rebuild trust in our government and ensure that every Georgia voter has equal opportunity to elect candidates that share their lived experiences and values, we must guarantee that the redistricting process is open, transparent, and provides ample access for public input. This should include creating multiple avenues for public comment to be submitted, including but not limited to a website portal, email address, and public hearings conducted both virtually and in person. We should create and brainstorm with our communities on more inclusive options to participate while also allowing for inclusive op options for communities to engage in the process. We should ensure that we provide live language translation, translation services, public access to the data used to draft maps, as well as a public comment period on draft and final maps before passage. Dr. Smith, if you would just take about 10 seconds and wrap up, please. Thank you. Let's do this work to ensure that the residents of this community are provided with equitable access, equitable access to health care, food, housing, stronger infrastructure, and greater economic development opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Audrey McNeil, please. Audrey McNeil. Good evening, members and chairs of the redistricting committee. My name is Audrey McNeil, and I'm an intern for a state representative, as well as a 2020 delegate to the Democratic National Convention on behalf of the constituents of Georgia's 11th district. As a resident of Kennesaw, Georgia, extreme partisanship has plagued my life. It has caused division in my educational community, so much so that I felt morally obligated to found a club called Political Converse in order to promote political unity. But one thing that partisanship should never plague is the integrity of our political elections via the drawing of our maps and the ideals of our democracy. Federal law requires that districts must have nearly equal populations in a format that does not dilute the voting strength and does not discriminate on the basis of race or color as it would violate the, Vi the Voting Rights Act. There is a great quote written on the walls of the Library of Congress. It states that the chief glory of every people arises from its authors. The way that we carry out reapportionment is a question of our character and who we are as an American democracy. The way that we draw a district line should be fair transparent and should pr prioritize the needs of the people before the needs of the party. Thank you. Thank you. Harry Underwood. Mr. Harry Underwood, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have the floor, thank you. Thank you, hi, uh, my name is Harry Underwood and uh, I'm a resident of Columbus, Georgia, a resident of Georgia since 1993 for most of my life and a board member of Better Ballot Georgia, which advocates for instant runoff voting, also known as ranked choice voting. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you how shameful and tiring I find this practice of redistricting by elected partisan elected officials and how we Georgians ought to know better that this political system of winner take all elections, of partisan redistricting by legislators, of restrictive ballot access laws, perpetuate a baked in culture of constant two-way factional disrespect, drowning out the needs of our state's residents. 
Other than these United States, no other political system on earth has quite the amount of unilateral temerity shared among so many elected legislators to bake in incumbent advantages into the very land on which we live for their own and their friend's own benefit over the next 10 years and five elections. The people of this state, no matter what party we may support, should feel upset that our elected legislators won't let themselves compete on competitive grounds, nor let themselves be judged by their ideas and goals for legislation across whole communities, not partitioned neighborhoods who are traded between districts because of their partisan lean. We have done this for over 200 plus years, with one party having done this for most of this time, and another party which gained power in the early 2000s now doing the same thing. It is time to say enough. The people of the state should demand a better political system than is be, than that being exhibited through this committee. Georgia should should adopt independent, nonpartisan redistricting by a jury of citizens representative of our state's demographics. Georgia should adopt multi-winner districts and proportional election systems, including ring choice voting. Georgia should let those who want less compromise in their political principles register their own political parties with less cost and overhead than is currently irrationally demanded under state law so that we can have even more competitive elections. Georgia should adopt rules which count our state's prisoners who are currently barred from the voting franchise as residents of their last voluntary residence rather than of their current prison so that prison hosting districts are not artificially inflated in their numbers during the redistricting process. And finally, Georgia should join 30 other states, including our neighbors in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee, in adopting a state constitutional amendment requiring all elections in the state to be free, fair, and open without civil or military interference. These five reforms could make for more elections which in the state which are reflective of our communities and demographic changes without legislators feeling the need to create maps which bake in their own advantages over the course of at least the next five successive legislative elections at the expense of their constituents' intelligence. These reforms could make for elections in which candidates feel more of a need to seek consideration from all voters, not merely those who look, who quote unquote, look like they would vote for a certain party. And these reforms could set the guardrails for how our demographics are represented, represented in our General Assembly and Congress without pitting our legislators against their constituents. I ask the members of this committee to consider the option of nonpartisan redistricting, instant runoff voting, fairer ballot access laws, a ban on prison gerrymandering, and a free elections amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Navina Doss. Can you speak again, please? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can now. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, chairs and members of the House and Senate Redistricting Committees. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Navina Doss, and I'm the leader of the student chapter of the ACLU, an organization where students can discuss current events concerning civil rights and act on causes they support. I'm a lifelong resident of Georgia and I've lived in Milton for the past 10 years. I've seen the area of Milton grow tremendously, both in population and diversity. It still amazes me how my small town has developed. I remember the first time I heard about the redistricting process. My AP government teacher took us through the concept of redrawing county borders, which sometimes was exploited to separate communities and minimize minority opinions. I was absolutely shocked to say the least. I reaffirmed myself thinking we wouldn't live in such a world where our voices would be silenced, yet we clearly live in a different world today. I'm here to ask for fair redistricting maps and a fair redistricting process. I wish for all citizens to have access to public hearings across the state, for all maps to accurately re reflect the diversity of our state and for all officials to publicly provide the criteria used to draw maps and give the public ample opportunity to provide feedback before final decisions are made. I hope you all share my desire to make our world a better place. So I leave you with one question. Would our, would our following generations be proud of where we are today? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Katie Cassell, please. Katie Cassell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And we see you. So you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you allowing me to speak. I would ask that you um, give me some grace 
and I promise not to take advantage of it because I am currently standing in the bathroom, in the women's bathroom, right next door to where you sit. I am here today um, because I tried to uh, get into this meeting via, uh, via Zoom, and unfortunately, I was not able to get the link. I checked my spam folder multiple times, and the link was not there. So I got in a lift and took the 10 minutes from my home to come down to the Capitol building, where I proceeded to walk three times around the Capitol building uh, in order to find you guys here. And I am now reporting from the bathroom because there is no echo in here. The rest of the building is occupied with the echo of, uh, of this hearing. So if you guys could give me that grace, I would appreciate it. Again, I said, my name is Katie Kissel. I am a resident of Atlanta, Georgia. I live in Kirkwood, uh, where I am the president. Oh, I'm sorry, there's somebody here trying to clean the bathroom, apologies. Um, I am sorry, I'm speaking on the legislator. Can you come back? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so I am the president of Kirkwood Neighbors Organization, and I am also a legal observer and poll watcher with the ACLU. I'm here today for two reasons. I have personally witnessed the, what voter discrimination and voter suppression looks like when I was a poll watcher on behalf of the ACLU and watched as uh, citizens in majority black neighborhoods in Atlanta stood in line for three to five hours. So I understand that that is very much alive in what we are doing today. I also am here to talk to you about how you are going to redistrict. As president of Kirkwood Neighbors Organization, I represent a people in this community. I would like to see the redistricting lines specifically consider the neighborhood lines in different cities. For example, in Kirkwood, we are split between multiple house districts. This makes it very difficult for people to access their government. If he, it also makes the government very difficult to access their people. Most people interact with their government on a hyper-local level, especially when you're talking about a major city like Atlanta. We see our state house representatives, our state senators, our city council, uh, our city councilmen, our uh, county commissioners. They all come to our neighborhood meetings, and that is where people get the opportunity to interact. I would appreciate it if you guys would consider this and also consider that these are people's votes when that you're dealing with, and it's so important. It's so important to me that I risked the Delta variant of this COVID-19 virus. I risked coming down here in these very high heel shoes and coming in here and standing in a bathroom that could smell a little bit better. I think you guys could uh, definitely uh, talk to your guys' uh, 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 house cleaning about that. But I, I do all that because it is important that we get the opportunity to speak about our right to vote. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. David Horton next, please. David Horton. Okay, I understand David Horton is not in the Zoom room. Hopefully next, next we have Marion Brown. Marion Brown? No. Ingrid Landis Davis. Okay, Ingrid Landis Davis, I understand. I'm is here. I'm here. Okay. One second, let me open up so I can see you and you can see me. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh oh. Having a little issue with my picture. Okay. I won't take up any, any more time trying to get this straightened out. But thank you, committee uh, co chairs and members for holding this hearing. I especially want to thank my representative, Kimberly Alexander, uh, for her work as a member of this committee. 
Uh, again, my name is Ingrid Landis Davis, and I am the chair of the Douglas County Democratic Committee. I also worked for the 2020 census as the field operations manager uh, in charge of Douglas and Carroll counties. Um, I appreciate all the concerns and issues uh, voiced um, during this forum, but I especially want to ask um, you to consider the proposal from um, Mr. Ken Lawler, um, as he actually delineated exactly the, um, the actions that I think should be taken, that uh, we would be able to, um, that we would be able to actually see the maps after they're drawn and have a lot of input and several other issues that he brought up as well as Miss Andrea Young brought up. So that's all I have to say. I won't take up any more time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. All right. That is, that concludes, not our meeting, but that concludes going through the list of everyone that has signed up. And we're gonna go back through the list for anyone that we called out the first time and we're gonna give folks a second chance. Hopefully if you're in the Zoom room now, uh, you'll get to join us. So first is Representative Sheila Jones. Are you with us? Okay, Representative Jones is not with us. Next, Alex Ames. Alex Ames. Okay, I'm told Alex Ames is not with us. Next, Mason Cochran. Are you with us this time? Mason Cochran. Mason is not in the Zoom room. Maria Fernandez. Maria Fernandez. No, not with us. Christopher Bruce. Christopher Bruce. Okay. Um, Sensei Pirani. Sensei Pirani. No. Amaya Agnoridi. Amaya. I'm told no. Chief Marion McCormick. Chief Marion McCormick. I'm told no. David Horton Jr. David Horton Jr. Marion Brown. Are you in the Zoom room? Marion Brown. I'm told no. And I think, Madam Chair and staff, I think that concludes. We have now gone through the list of everyone who signed up and we've called, gone back to everyone who was not in the Zoom room when they were first called. So those folks have been called twice. Um, let me get prepared to conclude the meeting for this evening. I wanna thank everyone uh, for participating in this and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we do this so that we can get the benefit of your thoughts and opinions. This doesn't work if you don't join us. Thank you for giving your Friday evening and giving us some of your Friday evening to share your thoughts. Um, just a couple of things uh, before we go. I wanna thank my co-chair. I also wanna thank, we have some folks uh, present as well as folks that are on the Zoom, uh, members of this committee from around the state that are continuing to help us and assist us in the work that this can, these two committees will have to do uh, in the coming months uh, when the data comes in. Just a couple of final comments. Uh, one, if you would please watch and check out uh, the, both the Senate redistricting website and the House redistricting website for any notices or information about anything currently scheduled with regard to hearings, upcoming hearings, or anything else that we have going on with this committee. At this time, uh, we only have and only anticipate one more uh, uh, town hall style meeting and that's in Augusta. We've got a current date for that, but as things may change, always please check those websites for updates with regard to dates, as well as any notices or other information that there may be uh, about that. Um, with that, I will uh, pitch it to my co-chair for any final comments that she may wanna make and then I'll ask her to adjourn our meeting. I just wanted to thank a group of people who we have not thanked, but 
with whom we could not have done this. And this is our House media staff, our Senate press office, our policy analysts. We have Molly Aziz, Camille Taylor, Betsy Theroux. <laughs> I said it right. <laughs> we also have Ali Farmer and Julie Sutton, and we have the executive director of our redistricting office who is joining us as well. She does the really heavy lifting with uh, the, the map drawing that is going to be coming soon. So did I miss anybody, by the way? Oh, Andrew Allison, he's with the Senate Press. Yes, so they have done a tremendous amount of work in planning and organizing these meetings and setting up the technology. So thank you all, you have made us look good. I appreciate that. Um, oh, House Media, Justin Speck and DJ Moreland as well. So thank you all so much. And with that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>